Protus. Protus is the first kingdom we study in the Eukarya domain. But what are Protus? Well, it turns out they're pretty difficult to define. The kingdom Protista, and what qualifies? Well, basically, if you don't fit into any of the other kingdoms, we shove you in the Protus category. What I mean is, when we go to classify the Monarans, the bacteria, it's easy. If you're prokaryotic, you're a bacteria. But the four kingdoms that make up the eukarya domain, protus, fungus, plants, and animals, it's not as easy to define. Now, fungus, plants, and animals are easy to define. If you have these characteristics, multicellular, heterotrophic, cell walls made of chitin, you're a fungus. If you're multicellular, photosynthetic, and have cell walls made of cellulose, you're a plant. And if you're multicellular, heterotrophic, and lack cell walls, you're an animal. So this leaves everything else dumped into the protus kingdom. We're going to see within this kingdom there's a great diversity uh, amongst uh, the this one kingdom. It's very unusual because in this one kingdom we'll see something simple and small like a microscopic amoeba and also something very large and multicellular like a brown algae. So the point is, it's a pretty broad categorization protist. So let's get started. Like we said, it's not easily defined. They are eukaryotic, we know that. Most of the, many of them are single-celled, microscopic, but some are multicellular. Some are heterotrophic, they feed, they have to find nutrients, but many are autotrophic, photosynthetic. So what we're going to do is take this broad group, this ill-defined group, and within it, group them together based on some commonalities. For example, the protozoa, or the animal-like protist. Notice the zoa in here, zoo, zoa, meaning animal, proto, meaning early version. These animal-like protists may at some point given rise to some generic multicellular animal-like creature that may eventually have given rise to animals. And then we have the plant-like protist, or the algae, we're also going to throw in the euglena or the euglenoids in there. And they're plant-like. In what ways are they plant-like? Well, they photosynthesize. So we'll talk about those, and then we'll briefly talk about the fungus-like protists, uh, mainly focusing on the slime molds. And they're fungus-like in that they are decomposers, uh, breaking down material, uh, absorbing material across their, their surface, uh, very similar to the way fungus do. So let's get started with the animal-like protist. In what ways are they animal-like? Well, they're heterotrophic, meaning they have to feed, and most of them are modal they're, or mobile. They move about. Those are two qualities that we kind of associate with animals, so we're going to call this, this grouping of uh, protists, the animal-like protists, sometimes they're referred to as the protozoans. Now, we're going to look at four different groups of protozoans, the sarcodines, the ciliophora, or the ciliates, the zooflagellates, or the mastigophora, and the apicomplexans, or the sporozoans. What we're going to notice is that each one of these groups is differentiated by the mode of locomotion. That's why uh, we, we put something in the sarcodines if they move by pseudopods, we put something into the ciliophora if they move by cilia, or little hairs, we put something in the zooflagellates if they move like a flagella along with like tail. And then we have the sporozoans or the apicomplexans, which have difficulty moving and they basically live their entire lives in some kind of host cell, uh, these typical uh, parasitic uh, protozoans. Now, uh, and then we will talk about an example of each. Uh, for sarcodines, we'll use amoeba to be the poster child of all sarcodines, although there are many types. We'll use the paramecium to be the poster child of the ciliates. We'll talk about trypanosoma as the poster child, uh, or the infamous poster child of the zooflagellates, and also plasmodium as the culprit uh, uh, poster child for the sporozoans or the apicomplexans. So let's start with the sarcodines. The defining characteristic of the sarcodines is the presence and reliance on the pseudopod for movement. What is pseudopod? Well, let's look at the word. Pseudo means false and pod or pata, podia, means foot. That means false foot. The amoeba, here's a, draw, uh, a picture of a slide of an amoeba down here, has no definitive shape. 
In fact, it changes shape. Let's uh, stop and watch this uh, short video uh, and see what we mean by changing of shape. Whoops, where did that go? Let's try this again. Let's start this over. You can see it changing shape, extending pseudopods, pulling in pseudopods, and, it, and through the cytoplasmic streaming it changes shape and it can travel, typically following some chemical gradient, uh, some stimulus that it tracks it to one direction or another. I'll play that again. We can see in this um, a very definitive nucleus in the middle here. Uh, here's just a, a vacuole holding something and you can see all the little organelles and particles inside as it streams along looking in search of some organic material to feed on. Now let's move on to the ciliophore or the ciliates. The ciliates are named because of the presence of multiple small hairs on the outside. These hairs are called cilia um, and they use these hairs to locomote, to move about. This paramecium is kind of the most uh, recognizable of the ciliates. I added little black lines here because in this photograph it's hard to see the individual cilia because they're very small. But you can see that this um, uh, protist would move around trying to find food particles which would take in here and uh, digest. Um, and again, uh, an animal-like protist named by its mode of locomotion. Let's move from there to the zooflagellates or mastigophora. They move by flagella. We see this long whip-like tail helps propel it through its environment. The example we're going to talk, use for the uh, zooflagellates is the paramecium trypanosoma. Trypanosoma is a pathogen. It's a disease-causing protist, and it causes the disease sleeping sickness. And I pulled this from the Centers for Disease Control. It just shows the life cycle of the trypanosoma as it's transmitted by the tsetse fly, which is the very specific uh, vector. And the tsetse fly bite, bites a human, and the uh, trypanosoma moves in and, and causes the, the illness that we see, uh, sleeping sickness. So let's move on from there. When we move to the uh, apocomplexans, or the sporozoans, we see that while each of the others had a definitive mode of locomotion, these, the uh, apocomplexans really rely on a host to move. They're all parasitic. And the example we're going to uh, use as our poster child for this group is plasmodium, which is the protist that causes the disease malaria. We know that malaria is a very uh, prominent problem around the world in subtropical areas uh, where you have uh, the mosquitoes that transmit this uh, disease. And so here I have a very complex life cycle of the um, plasmodium, but uh, we see that the, the mosquito vector bringing it from one human and then eventually taking it from that human to another. Uh, we don't need to know that cycle, but just an interesting fact to know. Now let's move to our plant-like protists. And what makes them plant-like? Well, they're autotrophic. More specifically, they're photosynthetic. Um, some are modal, they can move about, but they make up the plankton community uh, floating in the water, commonly known as algae. We can generically call them algae. And as we look at this, we're going to see some groups. Uh, we're gonna, the Chrysophyta, the Pyrophyta, the Chlorophyta, the Rhodophyta, and the Phaophyta. And at first, that just obviously looks like a foreign language. It's difficult terms. But if we slow down and realize it's not that difficult, they all end in the same uh, root, phyta, uh, and the first part's different, chryso, pyro, chlorophyta, rhodophyta. Uh, we just need to learn what those prefixes mean. It's not that difficult with some time. So for each one of these, we notice that there's a common name. For example, the chrysophyta or the golden algae, the pyrophyta or the dinoflagellata or the fire algae, chlorophyta, green algae, rhodophyta, red algae, phaophyta, brown algae. You certainly are going to want to memorize those uh, common names along with the more official scientific name. And then some characteristics. We're going to start with the Chrysophyta, which are unicellular and golden brown in color. Um, they're commonly known as the diatoms. I'm going to pull up this picture here. The Chrysophyta, the golden algae. You see they make these very beautiful architectural shells made of silica. These are made of um, silicon here, which is basically glass. 
and these silica shells are, are quite uh, extraordinary when you look at them up close but they're it's very unique to uh, kind of build a glass shell around yourself and that's uh, kind of the unique feature we're going to look at for the the diatoms or the chrysophyta the golden algae they're all unicellular so very small microscopic but they make up a very large component of the floating plankton in the ocean let's move on to the pyrophyta the fire algae pyro fire these are also mostly single-celled. Here's the individual cells, uh, often having two flagella, the dinoflagella. They have some interesting uh, features. Some species of them have the ability to give off light or bioluminesce. And here are some photographs. Uh, you can see the light being given off by these at nighttime. You couldn't see them during the day because of the ambient light, but at night you can see them. Some other species can produce toxins. And this is a bloom of, of fire algae. It's so, so many of them, billions upon billions of um, cells here that we can actually see it from above. And they produce toxins called red tides. Now let's move to the chlorophyta, or the green algae. And these are the algae that are most closely related to land plants. They have the exact same photopigments, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, that we find in all the other land plants, or all the land plants. And so we, it gives suggestion that some multicellular version of uh, chlorophyta may have been the precursor to land plants. And we see that some, chlor some chlorophyta are single-celled, some are colonial, they live in these clumps where each of these cells could live on its own, it's independent, but they clump together in a colony, but there's no division of labor like we would see in a truly multicellular organism. Uh, I just have some pictures of some different ones up here, some single-celled versions, some colonial versions, and some very obvious multicellular versions of green algae. I apologize if you hear screaming in the background. Uh, middle school is letting out, and they're right outside my door, apparently. Uh, let's move on to the rhodophyta, or the red algae, in the f two minutes I have left here. Rhodophyta, the red algae, are all almost all multicellular. You can see someone's hands here. You can see relative size. These are large uh, organisms. Um, they are, are red. And what's interesting about them is because they're red, they're reflecting red light, and they're absorbing the blue wavelengths of light. And as we discussed in class, the blue wavelengths of light have a higher energy and therefore can penetrate the water to greater depths. So we find red algae living at, at depths that other algae uh, don't do very well in. And, and for that reason, it gives them uh, kind of an advantage there. Also, we know some of the red algae are used in, in food stuff to help make certain foods. And finally, the brown algae, the largest of the protists. They're very obviously multi-celled. Look, this is as big as a man. Some can reach lengths as, a, as long as 100 meters. Uh, they're common in cold water, uh, seawater, and a, a common example is kelp. Uh, kelp is a, a brown algae. We find uh, lots in the Pacific Ocean. So, we've moved from the very uh, small single-celled algae to these very large, uh, or single-celled protists, these very large plant-like protists. Now one of the things you can do is make a chart like this and kind of put all this in one place, you know, common name, right, number of cells, I'm not going to open all these now, but some interesting facts, and you can build your own um, uh, review chart like this, I think that would be a good idea. Um, and finally, if we want to close out the plant-like protists, we do need to talk about the euglena. The euglena is unique in that it's, it's plant-like and animal-like. It's very definitively modal. It moves around by this flagella, but it has chloroplasts, so it's photosynthetic. Yet, some of them can actually absorb food, so they're heterotrophic. It's kind of the best of both worlds, uh, the euglena. And it's a, a typical protist type that you learn in a gener uh, general high school biology class. Uh, amoeba and paramecium and euglena are kind of the ones that everyone learns at some point. Um, and this brings us to a good stopping point. We didn't get to the fungus-like uh, protists, but that's okay. And we didn't get to the uh, complex life cycle that we're going to look at, but we'll cover that in class. So this would be a good review going into uh, the next classes. All right. uh, review this, look over your notes, and uh, be ready for a quiz next time.